Well, keep your Bibles open before you in 1 Samuel chapter 13, uh, and let's come and consider this portion of God's Word together. Last week, we ended our study in 1 Samuel uh, chapter 12, where Samuel presented the people with the gospel of God's grace at Gilgal. You will recall that they had sinned terribly against the Lord in asking for a king. And although they were guilty as charged, we saw that they were given grace. We saw that Samuel spoke to the people and their newly appointed king at the end of chapter 12. And he gave them two options. Option number one, verse 24, be sure to fear the Lord and serve him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things he has done for you. That was option one. And option two, yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will be swept away. Now, we don't have to wait too long to see which of the two options King Saul decided to take. Saul had so much going for him at the end of chapter 12. He had all the makings of a great king. He had already won a great victory against the Ammonites. He had the whole nation of the people behind him as their leader, as their king. Uh, he had the prophet of God. He had Samuel uh, with him to direct his ways and to intercede with God for him. And he had been given the special enabling of God's spirit. We were told earlier in Samuel for the task that God had called him to do. And we saw last week that he has a God who was gracious and faithful even when he was unfaithful. Even in disobedience, God remained faithful as long as Saul would obey and serve this God with all his heart. So Saul really had no reason to fail, none whatsoever. But we find in our chapter today that things go horribly wrong. And this chapter actually marks the turning point in the reign of King Saul from which he will ultimately never recover. So overall this morning, this is not a very feel good passage today. It, it starts off OK uh, and then it just plummets downhill. And we might be tempted to think that it's it's probably best to just skip over this chapter and to to move on to something which is lighter and and more encouraging. Uh, and I was certainly tempted to do that in my preparation this week. We might also be tempted to think that this passage has little to say to us in our modern, sophisticated world in 2020. After all, we don't live in a monarchy. We don't fight battles with the Philistines. We don't have prophets uh, and we no longer have any concern about sacrifices. So what can we really learn about God from this passage? And how does it apply to us uh, as modern South Africans in Joburg in 2020? Well, if we, if we don't get too bogged down in the historical details of this narrative, and if we just take a step back from the, the story uh, this morning, we will see that what was going on here was something timeless. We will see something which almost every Christian struggles with to some degree or another. You see, this passage is not so much about Saul's battle with the Philistines. This story is really about Saul's battle with unbelief. What we have before us is a classic example of the folly of living by sight. The foolishness of looking at our circumstances, looking at our lives through purely human eyes, instead of looking at our circumstances through the eyes of faith in God. In the New Testament, we are told in 2 Corinthians to fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. We read earlier that we are to live by faith and not by sight. We are told in Hebrews that faith is being sure of what we hope for and certain of what we do not see. The Bible makes it clear that living by faith and living by sight are mutually exclusive. You see, you either trust God and you follow him by faith 
or you trust yourself and you live life according to what you can see and touch and feel. And so as we look back a few thousand years to the scene before us in Israel, we find the disastrous consequences of living by sight and not by faith. This passage reveals to us something of the misery which abounds when we do not fix our eyes on Jesus Christ by faith. When in the ups and the downs of life, in the trials and the circumstances and and the crises of life, we take our eyes off Christ and we focus our attention on the things around us. So I want us to see from this passage three results or consequences which inevitably accompany the the foolishness of living by sight. We see them in the life of Saul. We will see them in ourselves if we are honest enough to look. And so we need to come and study God's word on this topic this morning. So in the first place, I want us to see the folly of living by sight results in pride. Verses 1 to 4. Now pride is one of the most subtle and dangerous sins in the life of a Christian. It happens so easily and it often goes undetected by others for a a long time. But it's a, it's a heart sin which, which can breed and grow in private. But it's also one of the most destructive sins in the long run because it results in a spirit of self-sufficiency and a spirit of independence from God. We see this in Saul in these first few verses. He's just had this tremendous victory over the Ammonites. In the previous chapter, 330,000 fighting men had rallied to support Saul. And yes, although he did give God the credit for the victory back in chapter 11, uh, verse 13, Saul started to think that he must be a pretty good king. He had the support of all the people. Uh, He had all the talents to to strategically lead his army well into victory. Yeah, sure, God was involved in the whole process, but, but Saul was the catalyst. He was the king that the people wanted. He was the one who was really quite indispensable in, in the success that, that they had experienced. And so in verse 2, we find that Saul reduces his army down from 330,000 to 3,000. That's less than 1%. Was that not being a bit arrogant to think that he could operate against the mighty Philistine army with with such a a small force? Now, we obviously know the story of Gideon back in the book of Judges chapter 7, where where God instructed Gideon on one occasion to reduce the the army or the the group of men from 32,000 down to 300 in order for God to clearly display that he was the one who had given them the victory so that the people would not become proud and claim that their own hand had saved them. So as we look at our passage this morning, wasn't Saul perhaps just following Gideon's example? Well, perhaps he was, uh, but the difference is that Gideon was commanded to do this reduction of his army by God so that God would reveal his glory. But we find nothing of that in our passage this morning. Saul seems to have acted totally independently of God in this situation. He seems to have not even sought the counsel of of Samuel in this decision. Perhaps he was was wanting to to outshine Gideon, or perhaps he was just presumptuously assuming that God would, would rescue him and his people the way God had done in the past. But we see something else of his pride here in verse 3 and 4. We are told that Saul's son, Jonathan, goes out on a mission against a Philistine garrison with with his 1,000 men, and he seems to have had a small victory. 
Now, we are not told if Saul ordered this raid or if Jonathan just went out and did it on his own. I think if we read ahead to chapter 14, uh, it's most likely that Jonathan just acted on his own against uh, this Philistine outpost. But nevertheless, what do we find after Jonathan's victory? What is the, the news headlines that was, was spread across the land uh, the next day? Blow the victory trumpets, Saul has attacked the Philistines. Now that's pride. It, it creeps into our hearts so easily, doesn't it? Especially when, when things are going well. Jonathan was the one who went out and won the victory, but Saul was the one who got the credit. Now think about this in your own life. Perhaps your job has been going really well of late. At least prior to coronavirus, you are being acknowledged by your boss and your co-workers as being a hard worker, diligent, gifted uh, in what you do. Perhaps you are making your sales quota, the bonuses are coming in. Perhaps you are so good at your work that you've helped your company avert a financial crisis at this time. And so you are certainly in line for that next promotion. I'm sure you can multiply this scenario in your own life when, when things are going well at home, things are going well with the kids, things are going well at work or well at sport. How easily we take our eyes off God. How easy it is to start thinking, you know, I'm not so bad after all. I'm doing a, a pretty good job here. These people are right to, to like me so much. You know, I deserve that promotion or that increase or that recognition for all that I have accomplished. Pride is, is so subtle. But the end result is a gradual shifting of our eyes away from faith in God towards sight. And we start to, to live and, and make decisions based on what we see around us, which in these good times is usually based on our success and our achievements. Now, Jesus picked up on, on this very theme of pride in the parable of the rich fool in Luke chapter 12. And what we see there is that Jesus did not call that rich man an extremely successful farmer. He did not commend the man for having been so successful at grain farming that he had to tear down his barns and build bigger storehouses. No, Jesus called the man a fool because he had acted independently of God. He thought that, that his success and his treasures that, that were stored up on earth meant that he was secure and could enjoy a happy life. And so God said to him, you fool, tonight your soul will be demanded from you. And then what happens to all your wealth? Is your success and the blessings of this life leading you perhaps to the same sin of subtle pride? Have you started to shift your dependence from God in all things towards yourself, towards your gifts and, and your abilities and your resourcefulness, towards your position in the company and your, your status in this world? Have you started to, to take your eyes off God and, and started to think like Saul. That perhaps God is only necessary in the spiritual realm of life, in the spiritual stuff. But in the rest of life, you're doing a pretty good job of handling things on your own. Well, how do you know? Do you make unilateral decisions without spending much time on your knees in prayer before God? Do you get upset when people challenge your your authority or, or question your decisions? Do you take credit for success which is clearly coming from the hand of God? Do you base your security and your need for God on the status of your balance sheet? If so, I may not see it and others may not see it, but the folly of pride has started to take root in your heart. 
And so in the second place, then I want us to see that the folly of living by sight also results in anxiety in verses 5 to 8. Now, anxiety is the exact opposite to pride and arrogance. Pride results from looking at the positives in our lives and overestimating our involvement in that. In looking at all the blessings from God and then taking the credit for ourselves. That's pride. Anxiety, however, results from looking at the negatives in our lives and not seeing that God is in control. Now, in both cases, two opposite results from the same root cause. When we take our eyes off God, it will either lead to pride when things go well, or it will lead to fear and anxiety when things go wrong. Look at what happens next with Saul and the people. Jonathan has this little victory over the Philistine outpost in Geba, which Saul takes credit for, there's pride, and, and this provokes the sleeping giant to awake. I'm sure you've seen this on cartoons before, when one of the characters gets into, into a fight with, with an enemy of their own size, or, or usually a little bit smaller, only to find that the enemy is actually the little baby who then scurries off back to the cave or the den and sends out the angry mother to come and deal with the problem. That's what we have here. We have a mother of all problems. Saul provokes the Philistines to war. And they arrive in all their might. 3,000 uh, 3, chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and more soldiers than you can number. Saul suddenly realizes that his 3,000 men might be a little bit thin on the ground. And so he summons all of Israel back to war. But soldiers don't like to be recalled uh, just after they've been sent home. And we're not told how many responded, but clearly it was nothing near to the former glory days of 300,000 soldiers. And so what we find is that the Israelite army realizes that they are significantly outnumbered and fear and anxiety takes over. Suddenly, having a king to lead you into battle against your enemies does not seem too appealing when you are staring a few hundred thousand smelly Philistines in the face. And so we are told that most of the army just go AWOL. They scatter in every direction. Some hide in caves. Others crawl under bushes. Some climb under rocks and into wells. And it's a, it's a pathetic scene. Those who did not run away, we are told, are quaking with fear. These are supposed to be the bravest of the brave, and we are told that they are terrified. And we are not surprised because when Saul counts his army, only 600 men are left. Living by sight resulted in crippling fear. The army has all but dissolved to nothing. And I want you to see that it, it wasn't only the army that panicked. It was Saul that was rattled too. And we will look next at how he acted. But what we see is that he was continuing to live by sight. When the, the odds are stacked against you, living by sight always results in fear and anxiety. I found something interesting in my study of this passage. The phrase, do not worry, occurs nine times in the New Testament. And, and every time, it is a message from God to man. Eight times from Jesus to us to, to not be anxious about what we will eat or, or drink or wear. Not to worry about tomorrow, which includes all the tomorrows after tomorrow. Not to worry about when you are persecuted, not to worry how you will defend yourself and what you will say. Jesus tells us to stop all worrying about life itself. Now, contrary to what some people think, Jesus here was not supporting Bobby McFerrin's famous song, eh, Don't Worry, Be Happy, because that song doesn't give us any reason or basis for our faith. 
Because that song doesn't give us any reason or basis for, for not worrying. It simply promotes ostrich happiness. Head in the sand, happiness, denial of responsibility, happiness. Now, contrary to, to what some people think, Jesus was not supporting Bobby McFerrin's famous song, Don't Worry, Be Happy. Because that song doesn't give us any reason or basis for not worrying. It simply promotes what I call ostrich happiness, head in the sand happiness, denial of responsibility happiness. Jesus, however, ends off all his exhortations to us not to worry with the concrete basis for not worrying. In Luke 12 verse 30, he says, do not worry for the pagan world runs after all these things and your father knows that you need them. But seek his kingdom and these things will be given to you as well. Do you see what Jesus is saying? Put in different words, Jesus is saying, live by faith and not by sight. Stop worrying about all that you see around you. I know that there are a, a million Philistines on your doorstep. I know that there are millions of coronavirus bugs floating around in the air. Don't you think that I can wipe them out in a single word? I know that you are in a financial crunch because of the lockdown. I know that your health is troubling you because of the coronavirus. I know that that person at work is making your life miserable. I know that your loved one has cancer. I know that you have to retire soon. I know that your security is being threatened. I know, says Jesus, and your heavenly father knows and he is in control. Keep your eyes on me, says Jesus. Live by faith in me. Keep trusting in me. Seek first my kingdom because I know what is best and I'm working out all things for the good of those who love me. Arrogance and anxiety. Pride and fear. These are two opposite sinful attitudes which result when we take our eyes off God. Two sinful attitudes which result when we look at the situation that we find ourselves in purely from a human perspective. And we live by sight instead of committing ourselves in complete dependence to God in faith. The final thing we see from this passage is that the folly of living by sight results in disobedience. Verses 9 to 15. You see, pride in the good times started Saul off on this journey of, of self-reliance and independence, which then in turn resulted in anxiety and fear in the bad times, taking control of his emotions. The problem with both of these attitudes of the heart, both pride and fear, is that eventually they leave the domain of the heart and they move into the realm of action. And they result in disobedience to God. Saul was clearly instructed by Samuel to wait for seven days for Samuel to arrive. Why seven days? Well, we are not told. Surely uh, Samuel could have come sooner. Surely it was bad military strategy to, to sit for seven days in front of such a formidable enemy. Surely God knew that the men were terrified. Well, of course, God knew all of these things, but all of those things are sight things. God was testing Saul in the matters of faith. He was saying to him, Saul, I want you to learn dependence on on me by waiting for seven days in obedience. Trust in me, Saul, and I will bless you and deliver you if you follow me in faith. Do you remember how Jesus had to teach this exact same lesson to Mary and Martha? You'll recall that account when their brother Lazarus was desperately ill and they sent for Jesus to urgently come 
It was literally a matter of life or death. But in John 11, we read these amazing words. Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. Yet, when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was two more days. Then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. Did you see that? Jesus loved Mary and Martha and Lazarus. He loved them. And yet, he deliberately delayed his arrival so that they could learn to live by faith and not by sight. There's a wonderful song written by Aaron Wilburn called Four Days Late, which has been sung by various Christian singers over the years. Let me read some of the lyrics to you. The news came to Jesus. Please come fast. Lazarus is sick and without your help, he will not last. Mary and Martha watched their brother die. They waited for Jesus. He did not come and they wondered why. The dead watch was over, buried four days. Somebody said, he'll soon be here. The Lord's on his way. Martha ran to him and then she cried, Lord, if you had been here, you could have healed him. He'd still be alive. But you're four days late and all help is gone. Lord, we don't understand why you waited so long. But his way is God's way, not yours or mine. And isn't it great when he's four days late, he's still on time. Sadly for Saul and for us, when we live by sight and not by faith, we, we end up taking matters into our own hands whenever possible. And the end result is disobedience to God's commands. Now, we won't go into the details of, of what Saul did this morning, but he clearly sinned against God by offering the sacrifice. This was a, a function limited exclusively to the priests, to the office of priest, and there were strict biblical regulations that governed the giving of sacrifices and offerings. But Saul's real sin here, the sin underneath the sin of this impatient sacrifice, was that Saul did not trust God enough to obey him. He did not trust God enough to wait for God's timing. He was acting from a heart of pride on the one hand and independence. I'll just take on the office of priest. And from fear on the other hand, if I don't act now, all hope is lost. And so he decided that he would take control of things which God had not given to him to control. Isn't that the same with us so often? Either when we are living in pride because things are going well in our lives, or when we are living in fear because things are coming unstuck, the wheels are coming off. We end up doing things which show God that we are wanting to take control of life. And with that, we carry a burden which God did not intend for us to carry because we are not God. And once we start down this road, we get into this downward spiral of sin. And we see this with Paul. When Samuel confronts him about his sinful actions, he looks to shift the blame to everyone else. Look at verse 11. What have you done? asked Samuel. Saul replied, when I saw that the men were scattering, it's their fault. And then you did not come at the set time. It's your fault. And then the Philistines were assembling at Michmash. It's their fault. And so I felt compelled to offer the burnt offering. I forced myself to do it. You see what he says? It's not my fault. It's, it's your fault, Samuel. If you had been on time, I would not have had to sin. You made me do it. How often? Have we thrown this accusation at God? Lord, if only you had done this or that for me. Lord, if you had put me in this situation or you hadn't put me in this situation. Lord, if you'd only come four days earlier, my brother Lazarus would not have died. 
Now this is nothing new, is it? Think back to what happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. That first married couple, they were enjoying all the blessings of, of love and companionship together. And then they sin. They chose to, to listen to the devil and to live by sight and, and not by faith in God's word. And no sooner had they sinned that Adam turns around to God and says, The woman you gave me, she made me do it. It's your fault, God. You gave her to me. Do you see the foolishness of living by sight? It ends up in us blaming God for the sins that we've committed. Or at least blaming others. The folly of living by sight results in pride. It results in fear. And ultimately both of those lead to disobedience. It's this downward spiral of sin which bottoms out in us shaking our fists at God in anger because we want to blame God for the mess that we have got ourselves into. Now back in Genesis chapter 3 when Adam responded by blaming God for having, having given him Eve... God could have just wiped Adam and Eve out at that point and started over. It would certainly have been much easier. In 1 Samuel 13, the passage we're looking at, when Saul blamed Samuel, the prophet of God, for being late. God could have just wiped Saul out at that point and started over with a new king. It would have been so much easier. But what does God do? In Genesis 3.15, God turns to the serpent, the devil, and he says to him, I know that you are the cause of all of this, and I will one day send a man, the seed of the woman, and he will crush you. And so we see that promise from Genesis 3.15 starting to come to fruition in this otherwise dark and sad chapter of 1 Samuel 13. Samuel says to Saul, you have acted foolishly because you have lived by sight and not by faith. There are consequences. Your kingdom will not endure forever. But Saul, God is faithful to his people. God will raise up another king. God has appointed a man after his own heart. And he will lead God's people to victory. Now we know that this is a, a prophetic announcement of young King David. He's not too far away. We'll meet him soon in the chapters ahead. But these words of Samuel are of far greater prophetic significance. Because they speak about King David's greater son. They speak about the Lord Jesus Christ who came as a fulfillment of all that God has promised back in Genesis chapter 3. And so as, as you and I consider our situation today, if we are honest and we acknowledge our pride on the one hand and our fear and our disobedience to God when we so often walk by sight and not by faith, surely it would have been so much easier for God to just wipe us out and to start over. But he doesn't do that, does he? He remains faithful to a promise that he made thousands of years ago in Genesis 3. He sent us Jesus Christ to be bruised by the serpent, to die on a cross as we remembered last weekend, and then to rise from the dead, thereby crushing the serpent's head so that we can live by faith in him as our king. And so this portion of scripture today leaves us again with two options. We can choose to live our lives based on our own performance, with a performance-based identity, which if we do well, it will lead to pride, which will lead to disobedience, or if we do badly, things don't go well, it will lead to fear and anxiety, which will lead to disobedience. 
You see, no matter which way things go, if we are basing our identity on our own performance, we will end up in the same mess as King Saul with eternally devastating consequences. But option two is that we can choose to live our lives and base our identity on Jesus Christ's performance. We can recognize that he has achieved everything for us, everything that we will ever need in this life and everything in the life to come, everything we need to stand before God one day has been accomplished for us by Jesus Christ. When we recognize that who we are in this life and who we will be in heaven one day is all bound up in who Jesus is, what he has done, then there is no place for, for pride in our lives because he has done it all. And we can recognize that every situation we face, Jesus has faced before us, Jesus is facing with us, and so there is no place then for fear because he has conquered all evil and he is reigning even now over all things. If our pride is replaced with humility before God and fear is replaced with a deep trust in God, then we too have begun to understand what it means to be a man or a woman or a boy or girl after God's own heart. We've started to become like our Savior, and we will continue to be transformed into his likeness day by day as we live by faith and not by sight. So let me just close by reading you the rest of the lyrics from that song that I quoted earlier. Jesus said, Martha, show me the grave. But she said, Lord, you don't understand. He's been there four days. The gravestone was rolled back. Then Jesus cried, Lazarus, come forward. Then somebody said, he's alive, he's alive. You may be fighting a battle of fear. You cry to the Lord, I need you, but he has not appeared. Friends, don't be discouraged because he's still the same. He'll soon be here. He'll roll back the stone and he'll call out your name. For his way is God's way, not yours or mine. And isn't it great when he's four days late, he's still on time. Well, let's come to this Lord in prayer. Our gracious and loving Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you are a God who is a God of encouragement a God who even in a passage, a, a dark and sad passage of scripture like this, helps us to see the light of the glory of Jesus Christ shining through. We thank you that you are a God who is faithful even when we are unfaithful, even when we sin through pride or, or fear and anxiety and that leads to disobedience in our lives. Lord, you are a God who remains faithful to your promises. We want to thank you this morning for the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to thank you for his victory over Satan. We want to thank you for his victory over death that we considered last weekend. And we thank you even now that he is reigning, sovereignly ruling over all things, even the situation we find ourselves in. And so we thank you for this reminder this morning to, to not be anxious and to not worry about the things that we see with our eyes and hear with our ears. But we are called to look to our eternal hope which we have in Christ. That we are called to look to a God who is faithful, who is working out your purposes, who is extending your gospel even at this time in the face uh, of much crisis. And so we thank you, Lord, for your great encouragement this morning to live by sight, uh, to, to live by faith and not by sight. To live with our hearts focused on the Lord Jesus Christ. To seek his kingdom. And to know that all the other things that you know that we need will be added to us, will be given to us in your perfect timing. Thank you, Lord God, that you are a God who never makes mistakes. Forgive us when we are impatient. Forgive us when we take matters into our own hands. 
And we pray that we would all leave from this service this morning feeling greatly encouraged, knowing that we are in the palm of the hand of the sovereign God who rules the universe. And so we entrust ourselves by faith into your hands now. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I pray that uh, you will be greatly encouraged by this portion of Scripture today to look to Jesus. And we're going to close our service this morning with an old hymn that's had a slight rework with a chorus. It's that wonderful hymn, Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus, Look Full in His Wonderful Face, and the things of this earth will grow strangely dim in the light of of his glory and grace. May the Lord help us to all turn our eyes afresh to Jesus Christ this morning.